Well, good morning, ladies, gentlemen. My name is Duncan McGregor. I'm a second generation Scotsman. You may recognize the name somewhat, as it was one of local and international renown in the 1880s. Now, this came about initially strictly by a stroke of luck when my father emigrated from Scotland to the town of Wilton. He bought a large farm there in Wilton, and it was on that farm in 1808 that I was born. It was also on that same farm that my brothers and I learned and mastered the frugal ways of the Scottish farmer. Now, when my father passed away, one of my brothers, James, contested the will, which had left the bulk of the farm to me. When James was unable to change the outcome of my father's wishes, he simply left town, took himself out to Iowa, where he became a prominent enough citizen to have a town named after him. Logically, McGregor, Iowa. Well, he came back a bit later and spent many years raising havoc about his due from the will. In 1830, I married Harriet Cornell of Gansbert. She was laid to rest in 1868 in the Reformed Church Cemetery in Northumberland beside her parents and later moved here with our son John, who died at age six, to the Bay Street Cemetery. In 1861, I often lifted longing eyes to the forest-crowned crest of our local mountain. It laid on the west side of our property and was absolutely beautiful. I first ascended to the top of the mountain with a picnic party and found it to be such a delightful location that I arranged to purchase it from the state of New York, into whose hands it had fallen for non-payment of taxes. I built a gravel roadway extending 11 and a half miles in length, clearing several acres in the process as it twisted and turned up to the top of the mountain. It was there on a sunny day, just like today, in 1872, that a crowd of about 4,000 people came. These were members of the local Sunday schools around Wilton, come to enjoy my hospitality. It was there on that day that the ancient pines were made merry with the frolic of youth, for it was beneath their majestic boughs that the picnic was held, the first of many pleasant associations that they were to recall in their waning years. It was on that day also that the ancient pines heard the renaming of the mountain, for it was on that day in that selfsame place that the Reverend Adams declared that henceforth that mountain would be known as Mount McGregor, named in honor of the host of the day, me. <laughs> in the subsequent two years between 1872 and 1874, the thought of the possibility of the mountain as a pleasure resort kept pounding in my head. And finally, in 1874, I constructed a small hotel and a restaurant atop Mount McGregor. And there I entertained summer visitors for many years, and not without profit. In 1881, by virtue of an offer made by the Saratoga Mount McGregor and Lake George Railway Corporation, I divested myself of all my holdings atop Mount McGregor, including about 1,000 acres of land. Now, this corporation conceived the idea of the construction of a commodious hotel atop Mount McGregor, complete with a railway to conveniently bring visitors up to the top. The chief motivator of this entire project was a gentleman by the name of W.J. Arkell of Canajahari. He was also vice president of the corporation, another member of the corporation, and the chief financier of the entire project was a gentleman by the name of Joseph William Drexel of Philadelphia. In 1862, if I recall correctly, March 7th, construction, I'm sorry, 1882, March 7th, construction of a narrow gauge railway was commenced. <coughs> leading from North Broadway in Saratoga Springs to the top of Mount McGregor, a distance of about 10 and a half miles. It started and followed along the tracks of the Hudson Valley Railway 
up to a point and then began to ascend Mount McGregor at a gentle incline. The station for Mount McGregor was located in the northeast corner of the property. Now this railway was finished that same year, July 17th, just a few months, and when it was dedicated with great pomp and ceremony, visitors to the mountain that day were simply astounded at the changes that had taken place. What had happened was that my small hotel, which had now become the Drexel Cottage, had been moved to the northeast portion of the property, the site of what you now know as the Grant Cottage, and on its original site had been constructed a majestic edifice, the Hotel Balmoral, containing 100 rooms and all the most local conveniences for visitors, including electricity, a welcoming sight for the weary traveler. During the 15 years that the Hotel Balmoral flourished before succumbing to a horrendous fire, it was a popular destination for both national and international visitors because it was so easily accessible by rail from Saratoga Springs, which in that day was at the height of its summer glory. Seven trains ran daily from North Broadway in Saratoga Springs to the top of Mount McGregor, and frequently extra trains needed to be added to accommodate the crowds who wanted to come to the top. It was a magnificent venture, and the sojourner to Mount McGregor today can hardly imagine the glory, the splendor, and the hubbub that prevailed at that time. Well, eventually, I repaired from my farm in Wilton to my mansion high atop Glen Street Hill. I had already become a very wealthy man and had purchased a considerable amount of property in that bustling little city. Of course, my fame was finally truly realized in 1885 when former President Ulysses S. Grant came to the Drexel Cottage on Mount McGregor. Fast succumbing to the ravages of throat cancer, but determined to complete his memoirs and provide financial security for the family he would leave behind. And this he did, crafting a book which some still <clears throat> regard as the finest presidential memoirs of all times. He had many visitors at the Drexel Cottage on Mount McGregor, including Mark Twain. And when he passed away, the papers of the world reported his demise atop Mount McGregor, and my name was made famous. Now, I purchased this plot on November 7th, 1887, and I'll tell you who's resting here with me. Helen, my niece, daughter of my brother James, and Luella. Luella, my brother James's wife. My brother James, somewhere hereabouts. His second wife, Helen. Myself, my wife Harriet Cornell McGregor, and our son John. I worked hard almost all of my life, and I passed away a very, very wealthy and a powerful man, and yet still sadly estranged from my brother James. Ladies and gentlemen, as you depart today on your journey, I bid you to consider the value and the freedom and the opportunity that our fathers found in coming here to America. It was a difficult and heart-rending journey for them to leave their homes behind. It was, as the Scottish poet expressed it, thusly, Farewell to the land of the mountain and wood. Farewell to the home of the brave and the good. My bark is afloat on the blue rolling main, and I ne'er shall behold thee, dear Scotland, again. Adieu to the scenes of my life's early morn. From the place of my birth I am cruelly torn. The tyrant oppresses the land of the free, and leaves but the name of my sires unto me. O home of my fathers, I bid thee adieu, for soon shall thy hilltops recede from my view. With sad, drooping heart, I depart from your shore, to view your fair valleys, and mountains no more. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a bonny, bonny day. <laughs>